Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today we have got the Browns, that's right, two Dr. Browns on the show today to discuss uh, uh, prayer, healings, miracles, and the scientific evidence and or maybe contrary to uh, that evidence uh, that we're going to be discussing today as we examine answered prayer and the working out of miracles. It's going to be an interesting episode. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Now, you heard in that intro just now, you heard that we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians, but today, well, we don't have theologians and apologists on the show. We have scientists on the show to talk about their research on prayer. It's going to be an exciting episode, but before we do that, I want to remind you that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded. There are links in the description if you want to support the ministry. You can give a one-time gift there on PayPal or a reoccurring gift on Patreon. As little as five bucks a month, you can get access to extra content on Patreon. And we do things like book clubs, uh, exclusive interviews with individuals, uh, and we do live Q&As every once in a while. So uh, if you want to support the ministry and get maybe some extra content, go check us out on Patreon. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to my buddy, Michael Roundtree, over there in Oklahoma. Michael, how are you doing? I am doing quite well. Doing well. Yeah, got an exciting week. Uh, today's episode, of course, is, I think, going to be, uh, well, I don't want to give it away. It'll at least be interesting, and it might be really encouraging for your faith. So, <laughs> so stay tuned in case it may not be encouraging to your faith, but we'll see because we're gonna go where the science goes, all right? Uh, so that's today. And then tomorrow, we have an episode that's been a year in the works with Randy Clark of mm -hmm. Global Awakening uh, Ministries. And uh, and so he can be a controversial figure because he uh, goes to Bethel Church and is part of, uh, of their fellowship and does some ministry with them. And uh, of course, all things Bethel seem to be controversial these days. So. Uh, anyway, but we're gonna we're gonna meet with them tomorrow, and you guys are gonna need to check that out. That's at four o'clock Central Time. And of course, Wednesday we have our Gifts of the Spirit episode, which is every Wednesday, and so stay tuned for more information about that. But uh, I would like to jump into this episode with Josh and Candy Brown, who are researchers of prayer. What an interesting thing to research. Uh, Josh and Candy, could you tell us a little bit of more about yourself and the nature of the work that you do? Uh, well, hello. So I'm Candy Brown, and uh, I'm uh, a professor of religious studies. And so I come at this subject trying to understand the history and the cultural context of prayer practices. And uh, I actually started off looking more at the long history, uh, really all the way from the early church up through the Protestant Reformation into the growth of the Pentecostal movement. Uh, and then once we get into the 20th and the 21st century, you find that there's just an explosion of interest in praying for healing from physical and mental and emotional illnesses and just an increase in the number of claims of prayer. And so my research is to try and understand uh, the growth of global Christianity and the role of prayer in that growth. Wow, I have so many questions to ask you. But first, uh, your, your partner over there, Josh Brown, we want to hear from you too. Tell us a little bit about about you and uh, do you guys do everything together? Do you do just uh, have kind of like a nuanced difference in, in your approach? How does this partnership work? Yeah, so, uh, so I'm Josh Brown and uh, we've had, uh, you know, Candy and I've had a lot of interesting conversations over the years. Um, my uh, PhD is in cognitive and neural systems. I'm a, a cognitive neuroscientist, a professor, uh, and so my my day-to-day -day work is is teaching, uh, you know, all things about the brain, uh, cognition, neuroscience. I, I do research on addiction. Um, I build computer models of of specific brain circuits, and uh, so I, I uh, do science. That's my my job, and um, and I teach uh, graduate students, undergraduates, and uh, and so over the years. Uh, Andy and I have talked about, uh, you know, her, her research and 
Uh, and, you know, we've, we've seen some, some interesting claims. We've seen interesting things happen. And so, you know, the more we talked about, the more we ended up uh, working together. And, and, uh, and I, you know, I got really interested in, in the question of how can we apply scientific methods and sort of, you know, careful investigation of a lot of claims, because there's a lot of claims of miraculous healings and and uh, so I, I sort of uh, come at these from an empirical perspective. That is, you know, what what can we learn by carefully investigating the claims, looking at medical records, medical evidence, uh, you know, even even randomized uh, controlled trials of of some of these claims. And so you know, we've uh, we've ended up working together over the years to do uh, do some studies uh, looking at. Uh, you know, what can we learn about uh, what people are claiming and what the medical evidence actually shows. And so I, I've sort of focused on that medical side of things and the, the, uh, the scientific research side of things. And so, yeah, and uh, here we are. Here we are. Well, I, I guess that very first question should be like, what does it show? You know, when it comes to things like prayer, I think the, the naturalist looks at prayer uh, and says, you know, you're you're talking to the wind. Uh, there's nothing that's happening whatsoever there. The individual who might believe in some kind of metaphysical world, they don't have to necessarily be Christian, may assume that there are some kind of spiritual laws or universal principles that exist that might cause some kind of effect. Someone who might not be as strongly a naturalist. And then you've got the Christian worldview who believes that there is an actual divine being who's in control of all things, who responds to prayer uh, and these sorts of requests, has the data itself pointed that Christians who pray actually get responses from God? Uh, that these things actually, they actually do something? I don't even know how you would begin to set up uh, a process of investigating whether prayers are answered or not. So I, I, that sounds like a candy question. Uh, is that right? Uh, sure, I can I can get started with this. So uh, I think the first um, foundation for beginning to answer the question is to realize that the empirical fact is that people around the world do pray for healing uh, very commonly, and their perception is that their prayers uh, are answered and. Indeed, if you look at the dramatic growth of particularly Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity on a global scale, uh, what you find is that uh, something like 80% of new conversions to Christianity in, in many parts of the world are as a result of people being really sure that they or a family member were healed in response to prayer. So people are sure enough of uh, this answer to prayer that they're willing to leave behind uh, the religious tradition in which they were raised. They're willing in some instances to risk imprisonment or even death. Uh, in many instances to risk being alienated from their families uh, because they're, they're desperate uh, for healing and they've tried recourse to uh, any number of other folk remedies, uh, any number of other religious systems. They've made, the, made use of whatever medical care they can get. But in so much of the world, access to uh, conventional medical care is, is really, really scarce. And so people will naturally turn to the spiritual and they gravitate towards the Christian as opposed to the other uh, options for healing because uh, their experiences is it seems to be a lot more effective uh, than than the other options. And so what we hmm. can show empirically uh, is, is several uh, several trends. Uh, one is that Christianity is growing on a global scale. Secondly, it's the versions of Christianity where prayer is, for healing is very common, where that growth is the most rapid. Uh, and third, uh, there's a widespread perception that prayers are answered. And this isn't just in areas of the world where there's a lack of uh, education or awareness of modern scientific developments. Even in the United States, uh, polls show 
uh, that some 73% of medical doctors are convinced uh, that uh, there are healings that are occurring through prayer today. And if you look at the total US population, it's more like 80% of the population who've had enough experiences where they're convinced that there's something more than just a kind of placebo effect that's, that's going on when they pray for healing. Wow, that's fascinating. Uh, anything to add to that, Josh? Oh, I, well, the, um, I mean, I guess that the, you know, we, we've been looking at what are, what does the evidence say? You know, what, what is the, uh, what does the medical evidence uh, show? And, um, and I think, it, you know, there, there's no shortage of testimonies, but if you look at the, the medical evidence, there are cases in which there are people experience recoveries that are very difficult to explain. And I think it's important to distinguish between um, something that's improbable, um, but, but sometimes happens versus things that just medically don't ever happen. And, you know, what, cause I think uh, people will say, well, you know, you're saying that this is a miracle, um, but it's really an improbable event. And, and at a certain point, you have to ask, well, at what point is something so improbable that it just never happens? <laughs> um, and so, you know, if you have, um, if you have an, an event, you know, where someone is completely blind and has been blind because the, the retina, the back of the eyeball is, is basically degenerated, um, then... I, uh, in that case, I know of no instances where the back of the eyeball will just regenerate itself and the person will start seeing after years of blindness. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of thing where, you know, we'd look at that and say, well, um, there are some things that are very rare, but they occasionally happen. Okay. So, you know, people have cancer and every once in a while, the cancer just, you know, goes into spontaneous remission. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and that, that does happen sometimes. And so at that point, it's an interesting question, you know, what is that, a, is that, do you call that a miracle? What do you call it? And, and I think what we've tended to look for in particular are the situations where, uh, there's no record ever of, of spontaneous remission, that there's no plausible mechanism of spontaneous remission, um. And I think those are the things that are that are more interesting. Hmm, that's interesting. And you guys uh, that are watching, you might go back and look into the live chat. People are dropping testimonies like crazy. People getting healed and operable brain tumors and PTSD. People are just like sharing what God has done in their life. That's fascinating. Uh, and this this also the question of is it a miracle reminds me of an episode we did recently with JP Moreland. I encourage our viewers to go back and watch it. And he just shares some miracle stories, but he defines a miracle. Uh, it, he gives two standards for it. And he's a philosopher. He says, first of all, it has to be really, really unusual. But he says, but unusual things do happen sometimes. And this is what I hear from atheists. Well, unusual is just a crazy world. Uh, but he says, if you mix the unusual, number one, with number two, there has to be, he just calls it something special. Uh, those two intersecting together, uh, for instance, it's not just that the retina heals itself, which someone might say, well, unusual, strange stuff happens, but it's also that somebody laid hands upon the person, prayed for them, and then immediately, or even gradually, the retina started to heal uh, afterward. And so he would say that would classify as something special, which is what you guys are researching is, is the power of prayer. Now, given that this is YouTube, and we've thrown some statistics out, like 73% of medical doctors believing in the power of prayer and 80% uh, of new conversions in Pentecostal charismatic world are uh, the result of basically power evangelism in one way or another, somebody uh, being healed or delivered of something uh, or, or their loved one. So um, I, I might direct this question at Candy because you were the one quoting the most statistics. Where can we go to, to validate some of the research that you've already shared as well as that which you will be sharing 
just so we know you're not pulling this out of the air because people do that on the YouTube on YouTube all the time. So uh, can you direct us to some sources? Sure. Um, so, I mean, if you want to look more in depth at what I've published on this, the easiest thing to do would look at um, the book Testing Prayer, uh, which was published in 2012 by Harvard University Press. Um, but for some of the statistical data, you might look at the World Christian Encyclopedia 2020 edition. You might look at the Pew Forum Religion and Public Life Survey of 2006. Uh, you uh, and you'll you'll find kind of citations and bibliographies in there to some of the specific studies that I've, I've given you references for. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, and you know, Michael just gave a definition of prayer, not a prayer, a definition of a miracle. When you guys are, you know, studying these things, do you have, what's the criteria that you're using to judge these things? I heard you mentioned earlier that, okay, uh, th this is happening in a Christian pool. Are you only examining Christian claims at this moment? Are you branching out into, you know, new age spaces? Are you branching out into, you know, Hinduistic spaces, you know, where people are, are claiming that this deity or this worldview somehow metaphysically healed someone? Are those things being compared and contrasted or or are you only examining the Christian claims at this moment in your research? And I, I'll just toss that over to whoever wants to answer. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll jump in first there. And so uh, I have actually done uh, work on complementary and alternative and integrative medicine, much of which does draw on mm -hmm. Hindu and Buddhist uh, traditions, for example. And so that's another book uh, called The Healing Gods. Uh, and so there is some comparative work in there. Uh, so if you take the example of Reiki healing, which is one of the many practices that I've looked at, uh, the best medical evidence, uh, according to uh, one uh, of the central organizations, uh, uh, the, which is kind of including Reiki in uh, hospitals, they say that their best evidence is uh, the improvement of seven rats. Uh, who did better with Reiki than those uh, without. Um, they don't have human data that they're even reporting uh, as, uh, as efficacious. Uh, Seven rats similar, out of how many rats? Uh, they don't tell you how many rats oh. they had. <laughs> 7,000, seven, seven uh, out of 7,000 rats. Right, it's, it's not super compelling. Uh, uh, Evidence. I mean, the best evidence out there uh, of the alternative practices is probably for acupuncture, but there it's really unclear kind of whether sham acupuncture, uh, where you're pretending to do acupuncture, is any worse than other acupuncture. So, so I have done some comparative work. My overall sense of the data, and I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, is there is a lot more evidence for claims of healing through Christian prayer. Uh, and this is borne out by uh, the conversion uh, data where people are, are converting to Christianity because they're perceiving it as more effective. Uh, there are examples of Muslims who are uh, calling upon Prophet Isa to, um, to kind of minister healing. Uh, and they're not necessarily converting to Christianity, but Esau or Jesus is particularly known for healing. So this isn't to say that there aren't uh, claims of healing through prayer through other systems, um, but what I've seen is more evidence uh, for Christian prayer. And that's partly why you see this kind of reshaping of the global religious landscape. Fascinating. Well, and uh, to be fair, even in the uh, in the New Testament, we have stories of unbelievers uh, being involved in healings. You think of Matthew uh, chapter seven. You know, many will say to me in that day, "Did we not uh, prophesy in your name and cast out demons?" Which is often associated with healing. Uh, and Jesus will say to them, "Depart from me, I never knew you." So even in our worldview. Uh, for Josh and I speaking as Christians, we have a place for non-Christians can experience some measure of healing. And uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13 speaks about that in an Old Testament context as well. Uh, I want to come back to something you said. Uh, at one point, one of you talked about a placebo effect. It, you know, my uh, when I was a kid, I had an aunt that if you had a wart on your hand, she would say, oh, I know how to wish it away. I was like, what does that mean? She, she literally would just like sit over, stand over your wart and just kind of wish it away. She wasn't really much of a praying person, 
So I guess you just look at it and it's like, I, I wish that wart was gone. And I never saw it be effective, but apparently other people did. Uh, I mean, is that a placebo effect? Do I wish it were effective. <laughs> oh, I should have known, Josh. I, my job is You'd to be less warty, Josh that's for sure. Up. <laughs> yeah. what do you do with such a story as that both on the the wishing level number one and number two the placebo level because one might argue that was a placebo effect as they might argue that for christian prayer and surely some of our viewers will need you to define a placebo effect so uh yeah. whoever could well, take I that mean, would be great so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start with that and so i mean there certainly is some kind of a relationship between your mind, your emotions, and your body. And so when people talk about placebo, that's generally what they mean. And so, and the idea is all you need is to kind of think positive thoughts, speak positively, and that will have a positive effect on your body. And to some degree, that's true. Uh, and so one of the studies, and this is actually one of the places where Josh and I collaborated, uh, was we, we went to Mozambique, Africa, and we followed around uh, a, a woman by the name of Heidi Baker and her work uh, with Iris Ministries, uh, along with her husband, Roland, in Mozambique. Uh, and uh, we prospectively, meaning kind of before any kind of prayer happened, we, we tested everyone who was presented by the community. And often these were Muslim and traditional African religious practice communities. These weren't Christians. These weren't people who expected Christian prayer to, to happen. But the communities would present to Heidi Baker uh, those who were severely hearing impaired or vision impaired, and they'd refer to them as uh, the deaf and, and the blind. Uh, and Heidi Baker would pray uh, for for these people and claim dramatic recoveries. And so we tested them before and after prayer. Uh, we published an article in a peer-reviewed medical journal, uh, the Southern Medical Journal. This was again reported in the testing prayer book. And what we found was that there were statistically significant improvements in both vision and in hearing. And here's where it relates back to your question about placebo is they were much larger and more consistent effects than uh, what uh, authors who had looked specifically at suggestion and hypnosis uh, on, on vision and hearing were finding. So if you kind of tell someone like, just try really hard to kind of see better, uh, you, might see a, may, you might see an improvement of part of a line improvement on a vision chart. But what we were seeing was going from not being able to read the very top line of a vision chart uh, to being able to read relatively small print or someone who couldn't count the number of fingers you were holding up from a foot away being able to, to read. Uh, and so what differentiates the kinds of results that we've seen in our clinical studies is the magnitude and the consistency of the improvement. Uh, and so the question that arises is, is the mind-body connection enough to explain uh, the level of improvements that we're seeing? Uh, and uh, I, I, I have not come across uh, data that really suggests that that's, that that's the case. So, so yes, positive thinking, positive speaking, probably not a bad thing, uh, but you're not gonna see uh, generally kind of huge levels of improvement. And, when you, and there have been clinical studies of just kind of um, placebo where you give someone say a sugar tablet uh, or a real piece of, uh, or real medicine. And generally all that you can hope for is some improvement of levels of pain. Um, and, but, but not the kinds of, of level of, uh, of what we've seen in some of our studies. Okay, so wow. I wanna be as, you know, we're, we're talking about these things and kind of, I wanna talk about them in as objective terms as we can. Um, when you talk about these miracles, these things that were that are being tested, um, are I mean, it's just so many questions that I could ask. Okay, first, I guess my, my question would be how how are we scientifically examining this? You know, um, because it seems as if you're you are looking at the before and after. So you mentioned like the Heidi Baker example, for example. You know, you you went down boats on the ground. It looks as if these people don't have faith in Jesus, but they get prayer and it seems to have some kind of actual effect on them. Uh, that can't be, all the research can't be in that space, I would assume. 
So like, I, I would imagine you've probably got a bunch of charlatans who want to verify their ministry as some kind of healing minister. So they send you a bunch of things to verify. And I would assume there's other like well-minded, good intentioned Christians who are trying to present the data in a way that is probably more favorable in an attempt to get God glorified and that kind of thing. Um, how do you guys sift through that data? Because I'm sure that that makes things difficult. <laughs> I don't know how else yeah. to say that. <laughs> so let me give you an example, and then I'll, and then Josh will have more to say on this. Uh, I've come I've come across exactly two cases of what looked like pretty clear. At least one was an exaggeration of claim, and the second one was a pretty clear falsification. So I'll talk mm -hmm. about the falsification example. Uh, so uh, this was someone who was, went on a kind of short-term missions trip for prayer and, and said, oh, I've got a testimony of my own healing, uh, and then proceeded to talk about how uh, his vision had gone from 2200 uh, to 2040 uh, in mm -hmm. his left eye after prayer. And so he presented me with a, a report, a medical record from his optometrist. And so uh, part of the due diligence that I did was I went to the optometrist directly and asked for uh, the medical record with all the appropriate releases and permission signed for this. And what I got back from the, uh, the medical office was this is indeed our patient, this is his record, but the record has been altered. And if you look at what was added to the record, uh, what seems to actually have been the case was his vision was still 2200 and he wrote in that it had changed to 2040. And, uh, and I, I followed up with this individual and I tried to ask like, is there some misunderstanding? What is going on? Uh, and I told him that your name is not going to be associated with this. The records are going to be de-identified. We're going to blot out all the identifying information. Uh, and he stopped responding to me, at which point ethically I needed to basically stop the conversation. Um, but my best sense of the situation is he did think that somehow he would get credit for this or he would somehow uh, be helping uh, ministry to take place. So that kind of instance does happen my sense though is that that is very much the exception uh rather than uh rather than the norm uh and i mean then i mean there is also kind of the the peter papa famous example where someone had like a an ear kind of earbud in and he was getting fed information from his wife and there was a big expose on that and again that you you kind of those those examples stick in your mind mm -hmm. um but i think those those tend to actually be the exception rather than the norm but we do try to always verify we do the testing ourselves we follow up with medical providers uh with the heidi baker study we tested every single person whether or not uh they uh, were claiming healing or reported to experience healing after prayer so it's very important to try and make sure that these aren't plants and uh to to try and sift through which reports are are more credible well, what was heidi's her. batting average if i might ask you know like what was she what, what was she hitting when it came to miracles? Like, was it a 75%, 25%, 10%? Uh, I mean, she seems to have more success in Mozambique than in other parts of the world where she's traveling. Okay. Uh, um, but even she will claim that her success rate is better for hearing than it is for vision. Uh, and so what we study, I mean, what we saw, we saw improvements across the board uh, for, uh, for those who had... Uh, hearing impairment, so better than seventy-five percent. I mean, we yeah, were wow. Well. So better than seventy-five so percent. Fly my dad out what? to Mozambique if he's going to get healed of his cochlear implants. Is that? That what I'm hearing, or at least there's a higher probability if we're in Mozambique for it to happen. That's good. To know. Um, <laughs> don't take him. Don't like take him to the Heidi like Baker. <laughs> yeah, don't, Josh. Don't take him to a, a Heidi Baker conference here in the states. Fly no. him to Mozambique, Statistically, where the real healing power. I want to make sure that we're we're scientifically. And I don't. I don't mean to like ask three questions back to back, but I did want to give Josh the same opportunity to ask answer that question. Uh, Michael, I know you've got a question on the tail end of this too. Uh, All good, uh, Josh. You want to? Yeah. How do you? How yeah, do you shift well, through the charlatans? To, yeah, just to go back. I mean, to the question of criteria, right? How do we ascertain what really happened? And and this is where the medical uh, the medical evidence really comes into play. And you know, we GMRI has been running for you know around ten years now, and we've had thousands and thousands of 
cases, you know, somebody says, oh, I have a testimony. Oh, I have this case. And, and, you know, so we'll say, oh, okay, that's great. You know, um, you know, could we ask you some questions? And so, you know, and we, we have to, you know, we have our ethical oversight. We have to get their permission before we, you know, start asking them questions and getting medical records. But, um, but a lot of those, a lot of the cases don't go very far and we've learned over the years that some some cases are are harder to investigate than others and uh, and even at that uh, a lot of times we'll start asking people you know well you know can you give us your medical records and they'll at first they'll be all excited and then they'll pretty quickly lose still there josh i i'm here Oh, yeah, he said. Do we lose Josh? They, they pretty, they get pretty excited and then they lose steam, like they don't respond to their emails. I see. Okay, is Candy we, still yeah. on? We still have Candy. Yeah, and I, mean, I can kind of jump in there because we can finish each other's thoughts. Uh, and oh, I mean, that's so cute. <laughs> so I mean, a lot of times, like just life events will come up, and uh, and and people won't follow through. But then, even if we get to the point of where we collect all the medical records. Uh, there, there just there are a lot of different reasons why you can't kind of carry through uh, all of the validation, or it may be that there are two different kinds of cancer that are very, very close to each other, and one never responds to chemotherapy, hmm. but the other one does, uh, or the there just isn't precisely the right medical test to do to be able to tell. Uh, whether this was uh, really out of the range of, of normal. And so what, what we have then is we have this giant funnel where uh, whether it's that the person just doesn't come through with the records or the findings just aren't as clear cut as, uh, as kind of what would the ideal standard be. And so, so what we end up when, when we actually get to the point of publication for, uh, for claims, uh, it ends up being a much, much narrower pool. And, and we would rather just kind of publish the really, really kind of uh, perplexing, remarkable, like medically, this just doesn't happen and, and have a few of those rather than have a large mm. number of more ambiguous kinds of reports so it, it's uh, not coming across the, their diets. It's not that the miracle didn't happen necessarily, but it doesn't, mit, it doesn't fit your scientific criteria for it to qualify. So like there could be, you know, a thousand authentic miracles that actually happen. Tumors fall off, blind eyes healed, but because there wasn't the necessary precondition of medical investigation or maybe some of the the the, the post miracle uh, examination hasn't taken place, those things aren't being uh, published by you guys because they don't fit your necessary criteria. Is that what I'm hearing? And that's exactly it. And that's not at all to devalue kind of if people pray for healing and they experience a dramatic life changing recovery, the last thing we would want to do is to kind of devalue or delegitimize that important experience that someone's had. Uh, it's just that for the purposes, especially of the Global Medical Research Institute, uh, it, it's focusing on particular kinds of healings that uh, are kind of medically very hard to uh, explain through naturalistic mechanisms. And gotcha. so it's just, it's a kind of particular focus. Uh, but there are many, many other kinds of experiences. Um, I, I mean, look at the, the Shrine of Lords Medical Bureau. They validated something like 67 uh, claims out of the thousands of cases that they've evaluated over the years. Excellent. Hmm. And it does look like, yeah. Michael, just so you know, it does look like we have Josh back on. Uh, we, we lost him there for a second. Yeah, uh, good to have you back, Josh. Yeah, thanks. Question. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I might have missed some of that. But, uh, but you know, basically what I was saying, I think Candy might have covered some of that. But uh, there, we get all kinds of testimonies. And we're basically looking for the ones that are the hardest to account for with placebo effects because I think mm. you can absolutely account for some of the, the the testimonies, the claims as placebo effects. You can absolutely account for them as you know. There's a bunch of other effects from from psychology, Hawthorne effects. You know, which are that people tend to tend to do better when someone's looking at them and paying attention to them. You know, people work harder, they'll mm. perform better. 
Uh, and so that it's not just placebo effects. There are lots of different effects that could potentially account for, for things. Another one's a holdback effect, which is, you know, maybe when you test people before, maybe they're intentionally sandbagging and, you know, doing worse intentionally on some mm -hmm. measure, whether it's, you know, their hearing thresholds mm -hmm. or, um, and so it's not just placebo effects. There are all kinds of things that you have to watch out for. And so this is why we tend to focus with GMRI on particular kinds of cases that are just generally harder to uh, account for by placebo effects. Also, we look for conditions that are uh, that are less likely to go into remission and then relapse. So that means we generally don't do a lot of research on cases of cancer because, you know, people go into remission and sometimes it comes back. We tend to not look at autoimmune diseases because those can also go into remission and someone will say, oh, you know, I'm healed. And and then, uh, you know, three years later, it, it's it's relapsed. And so, you know, we tend to look at things where there's some clear organic damage you know something is something is obviously wrong and and medically it just doesn't get better on its own um and and so then with that you know how do we how do we avoid the kinds of falsification that candy was talking about you know how do we avoid basically be either being duped and you know not that someone's necessarily intending to i mean maybe they are but but uh you know how do we figure out what's really going on and um, and so for us, the key thing is we need to get medical records. We need to, uh, you know, with with the patient's permission, uh, we need to get the medical records to ascertain what was actually going on. And even that can get really complicated because, uh, you know, you'll read the medical records and someone will say, well, you know, the doctor did these tests and they diagnosed the patient with this. And you say, oh, that's great. Well. I mean, it's not great, but it's compelling because it looks like that condition never gets better on its own. Well, the thing is, you know, one of our, we had one case where one of our molecular biologists uh, on our GMRI staff pointed out that if you look at that test at the time, the test couldn't rule out a differential diagnosis of another disease that is actually amenable to treatment and might well have responded to the treatment that was given. And so that's a case that we had to then set aside and say, well, you know, that's great, the person is better, but we can't necessarily conclude that there's no medical explanation for that. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of groups like that. I think we have basically a funnel where we have a, a lot of cases that come in and we'll look through a bunch and say, you know, we're, we're not gonna be able to take this any further. And some of them of what's left, we'll look at it and say, well, you know, let's let's uh, talk to them some more and get some medical records and then we'll get some medical records and then we'll realize, you know, there is actually a medical explanation for this because um, we have to do a lot of homework and, and we consult with medical specialists uh, and, and basically we want to make sure that we can rule out whatever other differential diagnoses um, might account for what was going on. And so, you know, for us to say this is a medically inexplicable recovery, we have to be very confident about what the original diagnosis was. It has to be a clear organic cause of disease. And then we have to have medical records, you know, after the claimed healing prayer that document that uh, there was an actual recovery. Okay, not just that they say they felt better, but there, there, is, there is objective medical evidence in the form of you know uh, biological markers or something that's more than just well i feel better and so you know with with that that sort of narrows down the number of cases that we look at quite dramatically um, and it means it's also a hugely labor-intensive process to to research cases uh, because you know we are interested in the absolute highest quality most compelling cases and so we publish relatively few but the ones that we do publish are ones that we have you know had reviewed by medical specialists and um and we're confident that uh, we can say that there's there's not a clear medical explanation for how this person could have recovered so you know we have cases of someone who was blind for 12 years because of the the back of the eye was degenerated and, and that medically just doesn't regenerate. And we have cases of, you know, a, 
uh, boy who was uh, had a paralyzed stomach for the first you know 16 years of his life and um, and so and we have probably I don't know at least at least a half dozen more cases in various stages of, of research now but we're looking at things like genetic diseases um, because you can't just wish your DNA to you know have a genetic uh, anomaly restored right you, you can't wish that it's not like a wart you can wish away well you know I, I'm gonna <laughs> wish away fibrosis or something you know you, you can't wish that away it's it's not it's not very explicable with a placebo effect so th these are some of the issues that we run into and how we, we try to deal with it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. I, I want to respond to uh, this co a comment in the chat from Darren P. Plies. Uh, it's, he says, it's totally bizarre if Jesus could only hear healing pro hear Jesus could only heal hearing problems. So this goes back to Mozambique. And so when we talk about medically inexplicable miracles, we've gone to Mozambique uh a few times in this conversation and the blind people and the deaf people and the improvement that we saw there i first want to just make a comment and then ask a question and the comment would maybe in response to darren p ply is like you know why would heidi baker see more healings of blindness than she would or sorry of deafness than she would of blindness and uh, i think this actually can be uh rooted in the scripture first corinthians chapter 12 where Paul refers to uh, there being gifts, plural, of healings, plural. And so um, a, a lot of interpreters will, will take this to mean that there will be some people who have a gift for healing this particular infirmity or that particular infirmity. I know somebody that uh, seemed to have a lot of success in praying for cancer. And so people would go and, uh, and receive prayer for cancer from that person. So. Uh, that's just a response to Darren, uh, Darren P. Plies, uh, that that's a possible interpretation actually straight from the scripture that might be playing out in Mozambique. But I want to camp out on Mozambique. Now here's my question. Uh, you, you guys shared a, a healing story of the eyes, but uh, we talked about the ears from a statistical standpoint. 75% of people uh, saw improvement in their hearing as a result of Heidi Baker praying for them. Where, did you see anybody, and I'm just curious, did you see anybody that went from deaf to not deaf anymore, deaf to perfect hearing? Uh, when we talk about these medically inexplicable miracles, I think that could be a great encouragement for our viewers. So, yeah, I mean, the two, the, yeah, the, yeah. the two were kind of notable uh, examples when we were in Mozambique. One was hearing and one was vision, because those are the only two things that we tested. Certainly, uh, there there is prayer for other conditions and there are reports of healing for other conditions, uh, including things like resurrection from, from the dead. So, I mean, their ministry is not restricted uh, to vision mm -hmm. and hearing, but, but our focus there was a product of trying to do a clinical study where we could report a, a, a statistical result. So uh, really it's right. kind of an artifact of the study that we focused on those two conditions. Uh, but there was one individual who uh, was, um, if, if, if you stand next to a motorcycle, that would be like a hundred decibels and you kind of hear how loud that is. And if you're, if it's perfectly quiet, that would be like zero decibels. So this individual had a reduction in hearing threshold of about 50 decibels, so very large improvement. At the outset, there was noise going into his headphones. Uh, that was the loudness of a motorcycle and no response whatsoever. Uh, just wow. couldn't, couldn't hear anything. Uh, and then after about 45 minutes of, uh, of, of prayer, uh, he was able to kind of hear quite quiet quiet beeps in the the ears and also able to repeat words that were whispered uh behind him so that he couldn't see uh what was uh, being said so so that would be kind of one of the more dramatic hearing instances and one of the more dramatic vision instances was a woman who couldn't even see that someone was holding a hand up about a foot away from her let alone count how many fingers were being held up on that hand uh, who was then able to uh, to read uh, fairly small print uh, and uh, with within a matter of about five minutes or so. And so th those were very kind of memorable instances of dramatic improvements. 
And if I can just jump in on that, the um, for the the hearing impairment, uh, we uh, well, I I was the one doing the measuring of the uh, mm -hmm. you know the before and after, and I was concerned that we didn't want to get practice effects, and and so I I intentionally tried to trick people <laughs> because uh, what we would do is you know we'd present a tone and. Uh, you know, so, and, and we would test whether they could hear that tone and they would tell us by pressing a button. Uh, and this is a standard test. If you go to the audiologist, they'll use what's called the carhartt jerger method, uh, which is a way of looking for what's the faintest sound that you can hear at a given frequency. And so I would, I would purposely try to time the tones unpredictably to see if I could get a false positive, to see if I could get them to press the button because, you know, I thought maybe they would think that I was expecting them to press the button and they would press the button. I purposely tried to trick them <laughs> to see if, mm -hmm. you know, their, the hearing threshold was consistent or not. And and with the Carhartt jerger method, you have to sort of try, you know, stronger and weaker tones until you get a, a consistent threshold. You have to replicate that consistent threshold. and. So that that's what I did. And so I, I feel pretty confident that the, the thresholds that we measured were reliable both before uh, and after the, the prayer intervention. Um, now, I should also say, Candy mentioned that the, the, there was about a 50 some decibel improvement in the hearing threshold. Um, but but the difference between perfect hearing and totally deaf is about 100 decibels of, of sound pressure level. Um, so the thing is, there was there was some background noise uh, while we were doing this. Ideally, we'd do it in a you know a perfectly quiet, soundproof, insulated room, but we didn't have that there. Um, so we we did measure the ambient noise and use that as a control. Um, but that that fifty some decibel improvement uh, basically got the person down to the level of the best you anyone with normal hearing could hear given that background noise. So I think that is, uh, if someone were completely deaf uh, and went to hearing just fine, that is, that's exactly what we would have expected to measure in that situation. Um, so just, just to clarify that. Huh. Okay, okay, so I've got go a ahead, question Josh. on frequency. What's up, Michael? Do it, go. Ask. Yeah, so you, you, mentioned, you mentioned all this stuff on like, we you know we we've we've investigated some new age stuff. We've investigated some like psychosomatic stuff, and, and the Christian response is just wildly different. There's way more. Okay, we just more data. How much is that more? Like, are, are we going based off of the claim, off of the scientific research stuff? Like, let let's say that we broaden the bubble a little bit beyond what can be scientifically verified, because we would assume if any of these miracles can be scientifically verified, the way that you guys are trying to do this. There would be more that actually happened, but just can't fall into that criteria, right? For example, someone had a horrible tumor on their back, but couldn't afford med medical treatment. So there was no investigation of that tumor to begin with before there was prayer. And then afterward, this tumor fell off. If we believe that healing that can be medically verified um, can produce results like this, then we know that there's probably many, many, many more stories and or testimonies of things like this happening. How many stories are you getting? And then of those stories, how many of them can be ver verified? So those are two separate questions. But how, if you were to ballpark it for me, how many people in the Christian world that are coming to faith are seeing these things happen? What number would you give us? Well, well just this from is what... where if, if you look at, say, China, for example, uh, researchers who are on the ground there say about 80% of conversions to Christianity uh, are because of healing. And so it's, it's widespread and the growth of Christianity in China is, uh, is dramatic. And I could give multiple examples along those lines. So, I mean, really countless testimonies of healings are coming in. And what, and what we're doing is really looking as a, at a tiny, tiny fraction of the ones that meet particular medical criteria. Uh, but if you kind of judge by how the religious landscape is shifting globally, there's an enormous shift towards Christianity. And it's largely because of these innumerable 
testimonies of, of healing mm. and, uh, as you mentioned, uh, deliverance from evil spirits, which is often connected with these healing testimonies. Yeah, that. I think just from what oh. we see it, uh, okay. with GMRI, there is, we've had, uh, we've seen thousands of, of cases, you know, people say, oh, this happened, that happened. And there's a number that we've investigated where we've said, uh, this all looks like there's no explanation. You know, we've had people with uh, their intestines growing back or something. And and the issue that we run into is that in order for us to say this is what really happened, we have to have certain very specific kinds of diagnostic test results. And in some cases, those those are simply not available. And so we would, in that case, uh, basically conclude that from everything we're seeing, it's most likely that th there's no medical explanation for this, but because we don't have exactly the right diagnostic test to, to nail the story, we can't make a claim about it. And so we end up setting aside cases that I would say, you know, where, where even the doctor would say off the record, I observed this directly. There's no doubt that it happened, but the doctor will say, look, I don't, I don't want to be a pariah. Uh, I don't want to get sued for malpractice. You know, I don't want the insurance company coming after me because there's no diagnostic code for a miracle happen. Um, so they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put my name to that, but it definitely happened. And, and so the, what it takes for us to be able to say, you know, here's all the records, all the evidence, and, you know, we're confident that this is what happened. Uh, that's a very high bar. And there are a lot of cases that I think probably would be medically inexplicable, but because we don't have just the right data, we're, we're not going to say it. And, and, you know, for me, that's partly the, my training as a scientist. I tend to be skeptical and careful and not necessarily believe even my own results when I do an mm. experiment, right? I'll, I'll double check it. I'll triple check it. I'll, I'll reanalyze the data to be sure. And, and this is how science works. You you have to, I mean, in, in psychology a few years ago, there's a big, uh, what was called the replication crisis, where it turns out that people weren't doing their research, you know, in a way that was going to be reproducible and where the results would replicate. And there were a lot of results that didn't replicate. And there's a lot of, I think, self-consciousness among uh, psychology researchers nowadays to make sure that we have the right kind of evidence, a sufficient sample size, uh, to so that if if, we, if somebody was going to go back and check the work, uh, it would check out. And and I, as a scientist, don't want to put my name on something if I'm not sure that you know we've done all our due diligence and we've checked everything out and it all checks out. But oh, praise God, that's yeah. yeah, that's the right attitude to have for something like this. Yeah. Hey, I'd like to come back to something you said a minute ago, Candy, when you were talking about in China, 80% of conversions come as a result of healings. And you said, I have multiple lines of evidence or example, or I have multiple kinds of examples along those lines. And I'm curious, were you meaning that you had like for China specifically, lots of different statistics and uh, data and studies to show, or were you saying around the world, you had similar kind of uh, similar kind of statistics of what's happening in China that you could point to elsewhere in the world. And, uh, and whatever those are, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, some more. Yeah, uh, I mean, both, both are actually true. Um, I, I more had in mind that China is just one example of where you can see this, this mm. dramatic growth. I mean, there are a number of areas, uh, especially in the global south. So parts of Latin America, parts of Africa. Uh, I did a collaborative project with uh, 17 other scholars who have uh, a specific focus on one region of the world or another, and it was called Global Pentecostal and Charismatic Healing, uh, and, and basically give, give reports. And, and I mean, some of them are are, are quite dramatic of claims of resurrections from the dead, claims of uh, a, a leg growing like three to eight inches in length. Um, uh, I mean, basically every kind of condition you can think of, there are instances of, of that being healed. But this really is a global phenomenon. And part of what I wanna emphasize here is that the United States 
uh, is is really a small part of this bigger picture. And uh, and where you see declines in Christianity in the United States, you're you're seeing increases around the world, and partly that correlates very strongly with the amount of emphasis there is on prayer for physical healing, but also deliverance from evil spirits and the belief that those are Whoa. responsible for a lot of the diseases. Okay, so am I right then in assuming that there are certain denominations? I mean, if I'm just thinking of these correlating things, if these groups are primarily focusing on healing prayer, deliverances, these sorts of things, and these are the groups that are growing by and large, are you saying that you're you're seeing probably a cluster of super? I mean, even if I talk to my cessationist friends, right? Like I talk to my buddies who are 1689 London Baptists. I mean, they are cessationist by the definition, right? And they go, "We pray yeah. for the sick. We go and anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith." Like, but you know, believing that God, you know, can will, and even if He doesn't, you know, they they would articulate healing in much of the same way that we would. But are, is there a correlation to the healings that you're seeing in denominations of people who are praying for the sick regularly versus others that that aren't or don't believe in it? Yeah, so I mean, denominational labels, I think, mean a lot less today than they did 100 years ago. Agreed. And so there are some Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist churches that are very much a part, uh, or at least individuals in those churches that are very much a part of the, the larger renewal or Pentecostal charismatic movements. And so really the big divide in uh, evangelical Christianity is between those who affirm the ongoing gifts of the Holy Spirit and those who, as you describe as cessationists, who believe in the biblical miracles uh, and, and believe that God is able to heal, uh, but are less convinced that that is a normative uh, part of, of how God acts today. And so it's a question partly of what's the purpose of healing. Is it about proof of the Bible and the Bible's messengers, or is it an overflow of, of God's compassion? Is healing needed to prove the gospel, or is healing needed because people are sick? And so definitely I've seen a correlation where there are more reports of, of healings where people have more expectation and they're praying uh, more often uh, uh, for healing, and that's really a part of their core uh, their core practice, their core understanding of, of the nature of God. Uh, and so often those would be more in the Pentecostal and charismatic movements, but those lines of distinctions are much uh, more malleable uh, when you go outside of the U.S. Than, than they are within the United States and its denominational structures. Hmm. Okay, so we've talked about the different denominations. Um, now I've heard you say several times there's the Global South, it seems like everything's happening everywhere, but here in the United States, I mean, kind of sucks to be here. Uh, why well, is God moving so there. much everywhere else? Like, I mean, is there, honestly though, is there enough scientific data to postulate why? I mean, you, a moment ago, you used the word expectation to speak of denominations that see more moves of God in the way of healing and casting out demons and so on. Is it the same sort of deal? Are, are people overseas expectant more? Does God just love Africa more than us here in the in the poor United States? I mean, like, what's uh, sure. what's going on? Well, and, and I mean, I can I just ask the assumption? The assumption of a lot of people is that you have to have a passport tag to the miracle because that's where uneducated people are. But here, where we have science, you know, uh, we we know better. We know that this can't be a real miracle. So, so I want to tag that on to the back of his question as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm giving you the numbers. Even medical doctors uh, believe in the miracles today. And a lot of the investigations we've done because we've got more access to records are actually in the United States. So it's not just outside of the Praise U.S. This, what this is occurring. But if someone in the U.S. has problem with their eyesight, what do they do? They do what I did. You go and you get a pair of glasses. Uh, if you are living in a place where 80% uh, of the world's population doesn't have access to conventional medical care, uh, that's just not even a starting point. And so it's going to be, there's, there's more kind of placing of weight on prayer for healing outside the U.S. because there just isn't the option to go for, 
for medical treatment or psychiatric treatment or medication. And so I think it is partly a matter of where, where are people putting their effort? Uh, and so whether that's phrased in terms of suggestibility or faith or suggestion, uh, the fact is uh, people are acting uh, in such a way that their their trust and and what they're they're really putting their effort into in the U.S. is largely into medical treatments, and it's when those those fail that there's a turn to prayer. Uh, and so, if there is a, an inoperable tumor, or if there is a, a cancer that doesn't respond to treatment, that's where you see a lot of the real kind of recourse to prayer in the U.S. And and you do uh, see cases of of people pray for healing and they recover in ways that are not medically expected in the U.S. Um, so it's just, there's more reliance on the medical science in the U.S. And I think that that's part of the explanation of that differential. Well, and God loves Africa more. <laughs> well, that's not at all. For years, we've been <laughs> blessing the rain down in Africa. That's probably what it, it's the holy water. Um, no, I'm just kidding. It's a bad, it's a bad joke. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's get to kind of some closing thoughts. I'm gonna toss it over to Michael for some closing thoughts. Uh, this is usually where we give like the, the little theological slash pastoral application to people's lives, uh, for, for both Josh and, and Candy, just anything that you feel like, Hey, this needs to be restated. Uh, the, the evidence is clear. Also ways that we can connect with sharing testimonies so that you guys can examine, uh, the data of other people's lives. Hey, I've got medical documentation of a, he a healing so that where, where do I send it? You know, that kind of thing. So uh, first, let's start with Michael. Michael, what would be that like pastoral slash theological application uh, from our conversation today that you think would be applicable to people's lives? Sure. Well, Josh, I'm actually going to hijack your question and ask one more question. Oh. So I just have one more. I'm burning to know. And okay. And he's muted. I know. Okay. I, I... <laughs> <just> okay. So <laughs> I know I double checked. Um, so it, it, this is for either of you, but I, I'm curious if you've studied what kinds of prayer worked because you piqued my interest when you said when people are far away praying for healing. I mean, we have stories of this in the Bible, Matthew chapter eight, Jesus prays for a centurion servant, doesn't even pray, just speaks the word from a distance and the per person's healed. So I, it, it just, it piqued my interest about the different kinds of prayer. What's more effective? I mean, in the Bible, we can look at faith being a factor. Uh, we can look at maybe um, maybe fasting being a, a factor and getting answers to prayer. Uh, we can we can look at uh, perseverance in prayer and frequency. Uh, we can look at the laying on of hands and anointing of oil as being factors that are often used in prayer and seemingly uh, contribute to effectiveness. So. Do you see a certain kind of prayer that is more effective? I, I want to pick up on that perseverance because I think this is the, the counterintuitive because there are certainly movements among Christians that say pray once and then claim that you're healed by faith, even if your symptoms haven't improved. Uh, what we've actually seen in the data is it's the people who pray often, persistently, they don't give up, they don't take no for an answer, they travel at great cost, uh, they get prayer over and over and over again uh, and are obnoxious about doing it. That's where we see uh, the most um, reports of dramatic healings take place. And you could, if you're in your theological language, define that as a kind of faith because it's acting like you really believe that this healing is going to take place and you're not going to give up, but you're, you're going to persevere in that. You guys heard okay. it here first. That's... Go straight to Michael Roundtree's church as, as soon as possible. The most obnoxious person I know, his faith must be really, really powerful. That's <laughs> so what I heard her say obnoxious. just now that uh, being obnoxious I, is... I have is, obnoxious faith. I mean, he has people ask faith. for like my closing thoughts and I just like deflect completely, totally obnoxious. So I, I will give a closing thought here. And, uh, and I think I would say I saw an atheist in the, in the chat talking some smack to us. <laughs> and uh, welcome to the chat, atheist. So glad you're here. Uh, and, and I would say to this atheist or anyone else who doesn't believe in the power of prayer, just contend with the evidence. I mean, I don't even have to do anything else. Just look at the evidence, okay? It, it's right there if you want to see it. Uh, you can't make up 75% of people improving their hearing. Uh, if you don't believe it, go to Mozambique. I mean, hey, 
eternal things are at stake, right? So uh, if you want to investigate whether this stuff is true, pick up their book, Testing Prayer. See if you can uh, disprove the evidence yourself. Uh, I, I think that, honestly, nothing on earth could be more important than figuring out whether God and uh, is really real, whether Jesus is really real. And this is one place that you could start is look at the miracles. I think the evidence is out there. That would be my closing thought. Well, and, I, and I'll say to Christians, uh, our take on the evidence is go out and pray. Pray for the sick. That's the, that's the application. Excellent. And then, guys, uh, you know, uh, just to reiterate before, uh, how do people connect uh, with uh, your, I think, GRMI? I'm going to get the acronym out of order. GMRI. Yeah, you're going to have to pray for my dyslexia from a distance. Uh, maybe I'll have to fly to Mozambique. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, I see all this stuff tongue in cheek as someone who firmly believes in healing and, and wants to see more of it. Uh, and I think that this stuff is really impactful uh, as I listen, as others listen, say, okay, there is. There is some kind of correlation causation taking place here and trying to sift through this data as a way to build our faith, I think is insightful. So I really appreciate you guys coming on. Tell us again, you know, what would your kind of takeaway from all this data be? And then secondly, how do people connect and submit their testimonies? Yeah, so you can, uh, if you want to submit, uh, you know, your story of healing, you can find us at globalmri.org, G-L-O-B-A-L-M-R-I.org. Uh, and if you're a doctor or a, a medical professional or scientist and you're interested in, in helping with what we're doing, uh, please get in touch. Uh, we're, we're looking to connect with people who are interested in that. Um, and I think, you know, I, I would say what we're trying to do with Global MRI is to, uh, is to publish evidence. And when we write these papers, we're not claiming, we're not saying, you know, this this evidence proves that you know God is real and did a miracle. Our, my our purpose is to publish the evidence, and you can inter- you can do with that what you want. Uh, but I think for all the claims that are out there and all the the evidence is out there, I think there you know we saw that there was so little actual you know serious medical record reporting of what was going on, and so we want to get that out there for people to see. Uh, you know, what, what's really there. Uh, and you can do with that what you want. Excellent. Candy, same question. Uh, so, I mean, I would just say, if you want to understand what's going on in uh, the, the world today, in terms of the growth, the shrinkage of different religious groups, uh, you really need to pay attention to uh, the, the fact that people are praying for healing as a central component of why they look to one religion or to another. And so uh, whatever religious affiliation or kind of attitude you might have towards religion, it's hard to overlook the importance of, uh, of people's praying for healing and their experiences that they have. And so uh, just looking at what people are doing, understanding the importance that prayer for, for healing has in religion. I think you'll understand uh, the world better. If you're in medicine, you'll understand your patients better. Uh, and if you just kind of want to understand your neighbors uh, you, and you look at kind of what their their responses are to, to illness, uh, looking at prayer for healing will, will give you uh, more of an insight into uh, what's taking place uh, in the world today, especially in uh, this contested area of, of religion and society. That's great. You know, we did an episode just, uh, you know, it was last year. I don't remember exactly what time it was. It might have been six months ago, eight months ago. Uh, I believe it was Gary Bates, and we did an episode on aliens. We just talked about, you know, all of these eyewitness accounts and all the testimonies. Are they corroborated? Are they true? As you examine some of these things, you begin to see the kind of glaring weaknesses in this idea that there's life on other planets. We've got entire movies built on the pseudoscience of these testimonies uh, that aren't corroborated, that aren't scientifically verifiable. Now, now certainly, you know, I'm not including the unidentified flying objects that have been filmed by military aircraft, but I'm talking about like just the lay person's stories of being abducted and examined on, but we are talking about millions tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people maybe across the world who are claiming these sorts of miracles at a frequency that is causing people to change their worldview, 
give over their lives into the hands of people who want to put them to death as Christians. Um, these are radical stories that change the trajectory of people's life. They're not trying to get on the History Channel for 10 seconds. These are individuals who are putting their family, their business, their livelihood at risk by making these sorts of truth claims. This is worthy of examination. So I would just like Michael encourage people to look into the data and the question would hopefully uh, continue to to resound in your heart if there is a God doing these things what must I do and, and my, my call would be just that of a call to repentance it would be man such a heartbreaking reality if you got healed of your disease or you witnessed someone being healed of you, this disease and somehow died in your sin um, as a Christian the Great miracles that Christ do today in the earth are powerful, uh, they're real, they're amazing, uh, but additionally, it would be such a horrible thing if you regained the healing of your skin. You know, you no longer have skin cancer, but you lost your soul eternally. It's a very simple thing to do. It's just to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and to repent of your sin. Place your faith in Him, uh, and this starts, initiates the Christian life. It uh, it's very important to Michael and Michael uh, uh, and I, uh, the, the two Michaels on the show and myself, that we don't look at healing as the end of the gospel message or this is the kingdom of God, but in fact, that it branches out into the real message of salvation, the full message of salvation. Not that just that God loves you and wants to heal your body, but that God loves you and wants to save your soul from eternal damnation. So, um, uh, kind of coming heavy on the evangelism piece here on the back end of this, but I really, really hope that my Christians who are listening to this are motivated to pray for the sick as a tool in their evangelistic effort, but also that those who are compelled by the data that says, hey, this actually happened, that they are able to make right relationship with Christ uh, because just trying to come to grips with the data won't be enough. Uh, we actually have to to, to repent and believe in Christ Jesus. So uh, all that to say, uh, really, really thank everyone for coming on the show. Josh, Candy, uh, Michael, thank you so much for contributing to this discussion. It was an honor to have you. Really great thoughts you were able to contribute uh, to our audience here. I, I know that the people who are watching are quite edified. And I just want to remind everyone who is watching right now uh, to make sure to like, subscribe to the video, donate if you want to support the channel. You can give on PayPal or Patreon. And also remember, we've got interviews coming up in the near future. Uh, we've got Randy Clark that's coming on tomorrow. Uh, we've got uh, episodes on Wednesdays covering the gifts of the Spirit. And moving forward, we, we go into things like the sin. So we're going to be hanging out with Mike Bickle uh, in May-ish time. We're going to do a series on the Kansas City Prophets with Sam Storms. Uh, we've got really cool, spooky stuff coming down the pipe. So if you want to watch stuff like that, make sure to like, share, and subscribe because we've got lots of cool content like that coming up. Michael, did I miss anything? Uh, just hit that subscribe button. That's it. I really did mute him, guys. Did y'all hear that? He said, hit that subscribe button. Blessings, guys. Y'all have a good one.